Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Thank you all so much for joining today. Awesome to see you all here. Hello, hello, hello. Yes, happy Thursday indeed. So for those of you who are joining us, we are doing our monthly Cello Tip Thursday live stream a little bit early this month. And of course we have some ambient green color because it's March and we just had St. Patty's. Um, gonna be doing some exciting projects that I'll tell you all about in the next coming weeks. So we're all here a little bit early. Awesome to see all of you. If this is your first stream, welcome. Oh yes, thank you so much. Um, someone in the chat just made a very good point we reached 7,000 subscribers on YouTube, maybe today or a couple days ago, but it's quite recent. We have 7,000 dolls with us on YouTube. Um, that's okay. Um, the live stream on Instagram is happening. Yes, I'm on it right now. YouTube might have just loaded a bit faster today. Um, awesome. So, hello. Um, for those of you who might be new to this, um, I come live every month, once a month, and we talk cello and cello tips and also any questions you have on the music industry. I know some people might be thinking about college auditions, touring colleges this summer, applying in the fall and winter, so you might be thinking about that. So yeah, all very good, good possible things to talk about, right? I could talk about cello all day. Never ending live stream, oh my goodness. <laughs> I get way too tired. <laughs> awesome. Yay, awesome, glad you found it on Instagram, that's awesome. Great, so I will get started. Um, feel free to contribute in the chat. Put some questions in. Whatever you're curious about, whatever you want to know, this is a chance to talk and come together as dolls, right? Awesome. So first question for you, how do you integrate breathing in your playing? That is something so easily forgettable for myself included, breathing in your playing. So one thing that helps me remember how to breathe. Um, I've been very lucky. I come from a very active chamber music background, playing in quartets, trios, little sneak peek. I have some exciting things coming up with my duo very soon, my string duo. Um, so that announcement will be coming shortly. But one thing we do a lot is we breathe together as an ensemble, and as a result, we're more likely to play together, meaning our rhythms are gonna be coordinated, we'll be on the same page in terms of tempo. So I always do a breath in the tempo I am going to play before I start playing. So, Especially, so let's say um, I'm just starting, I'll just pick a note. Um, if our tempo's one, two, three, four, one, two, three. I always do a quarter note breath. If I have an eighth note pickup, I'll do an eighth note breath. So one, two, three, four, and one, one, two, three. And that kind of already gets you in the groove of the piece before you start playing. Um, I always breathe in the character, in the character of the piece, um, in the tempo of the piece, because if something is light, lighthearted and peppy and joyful, I'm not gonna breathe like, you know, I'm gonna, something a little more upbeat. The only thing I will say is you have to be careful that you don't hike up your shoulders when you breathe. Often people, one, two, three, 
And they, they hike up their upper body because they're breathing in. Um, I've also had some people experiment with exhaling as well. Um, one, two, so. And that, so one, two, three. Sometimes that helps people to relax. So an interesting experiment you can try is exhaling. Um, so I often do that when I have rests before my entrances. Um, so that, that can help when you have entrances. Um, another place to release your breath is when you have um, longer notes, such as half notes. Um, half notes or quarter notes in a slow tempo. You can kind of exhale um, during those or inhale. I, I think an exhale would be better. And then here's something, make sure you exhale when you're done with a phrase. Um, because if you just keep holding your breath and you're not breathing, you are going to get very tight, lots of tension. Um, you know what, I was, I was, um, I'm gonna play something kind of different and fun. I'm gonna play a piece from Suzuki. Um, I find I, I always play a lot of flashy, advanced stuff on here, and I was thinking about that the other day. That might not cater to everyone right now in their cello journey, so I'll switch it up. I'll play something from one of the early Suzuki books. So, uh, oh, see, I didn't breathe before I started, and I just gave a whole beautiful talk about breathing. Two, three, four, one. So, right there, phrase is done. Start the next one. Um, someone said Twinkle Twinkle. I kind of play Twinkle Twinkle. That was um that's uh, Suzuki book one. This was um a Bach March in G. Um, what book is this? Book two. So we had we had a book two Suzuki. Um, so again, and I also realize I breathe when I have the double up bows. <laughs> So um, another thing to think about with the breath too, one reason um, it's so important to, you can learn so much from actually a vocalist because their, um, their, their uh, instrument is their physical body, right? You have your um, vocal box, they have the diaphragm where they get a lot of breath support and they physically have to breathe to perform. They can't perform without breathing. Um, or it would be a very short piece, you know? Um, so they're kind of forced into breathing. And in a way, our, I had this like odd epiphany one day. Yeah, I, I see you. Don't worry on YouTube, I'll get to you. I see you. Um, and the, the bow is kind of like an everlasting voice box, right? We can bow, granted we have to change the bow, but we can bow forever and ever. But we, it, it's the way we breathe is through our bow. So if you physically breathe when you feel the bow stopping or when you're at the end of a phrase, it will really help. Cool, next question from YouTube. Thank you for your patience, I really appreciate that. I just got a wolf tuner. I checked it before buying it and it made a little difference on F at the second string. What do you think of wolf tuners? Oh yeah, um, wolf tuners, um, it's much more common for a cello to have a wolf tuner than not. For example, Celli has one on his C string. Um, you can experiment, whatever works for your cello. Um, it's very common to start with experimenting on the G string. So I wonder where you've placed your specific wolf tone eliminator. I wonder if, what string you have it on. Um, and you mentioned the pitch F 
on the G. Okay, great. I'm glad you uh, you're on that because that's what I would recommend starting with is putting a wolf tone on your G string. And in cello, the most common notes to have a wolf tone on are around F or F sharp, sometimes E. And if you find that your wolf tone isn't making a huge difference, I would loosen it. It's very important. You want to loosen your wolf tone before adjusting unless it's a kind that is not a screw on. Um, some of them have a groove. Mine is a screw on, so I would loosen that before adjusting. You might want to try shifting it around if it's not making as much of a difference as you had hoped. And also, I love wolf tones basically. I mean, I think they're essential for cellists to have unless you have a very rare cello that doesn't have a wolf tone i haven't found one yet yes celli's a dude yes very loud <laughs> so, no i'm just kidding i'm a very loud um person that identifies as female so that doesn't mean anything um but i don't know celli always struck me as kind of a dude a little bit one of the guys i don't know just just a gut feeling, I suppose. Um, but yes, wolf tones are great. Highly recommend. The other thing to keep in mind, it is totally normal if one day your wolf tone sounds great. Okay, I notice, um, I notice a huge wolf on F. Okay, um, so let's say you have a good place for your wolf eliminator and then the next day it doesn't work. It can adjust with the weather. It can change with the weather because our instruments are wooden and they fluctuate so much with the weather. So I would recommend, especially because we're transitioning from winter into spring right now. So barometers all over are really going crazy right now. Um, climates are changing. So you might need to keep a vigilant eye on your wolf tone for the next couple weeks. So I would definitely experiment. Just um, spam the note F. So um, either on the D or the G string. Kind of in that zone between F and F sharp. That's what I would test for. And the other thing too, um, basically, the wolf tone eliminator counteracts your wolf tone and puts it someplace differently. So you want you want that wolf to be on like between F and F sharp or between F and E, basically an out of tune. Like that's not in tune, but if my wolf tone gets put there due to this, I'm not gonna have a wolf tone because hopefully I never play an out of tune E or F up there. So you might have to wiggle it around. We're changing seasons. The instruments are gonna be more sensitive. So um, the other thing I will tell you, I was very much like you. Um, I had my wolf tone on the G string and I felt like it didn't quite get it. I put it on the C string and it made a big difference for my cello. Every cello is unique. Try putting it on the C string. Um, I would do it though as part of your practicing time. Don't do it right before a big rehearsal or anything like that. I would, um, I would definitely um, try it out. Try it out on your C string, see what happens. Um, yeah, some would just put uh, with the seasons, my wolf tone changed from F sharp to E. Yeah, they do wiggle around. Um, so that, that's my recommendation to you. If you're, if you're moving around the G string and you're still not happy, try it on the C string might help. Um, and good luck. I know it can be very frustrating as the weather changes, but give it a try. Awesome. Um, why does F usually have a wolf? Some cellos have a werewolf. That's funny. <laughs> um, that, what I tell my students when they ask me something like that, that has to do with the physics of the cello. It's a physics question and is beyond my pay grade. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't, um, I don't know too much. Um, um, Oh, OK, 
okay. Someone wrote, uh, to be honest, I tried a cello, which is three times more expensive, and it had no wolf at all. You know, they do exist. They are out there. I mean, it can happen. I don't know why it's the pitch F. It has something to do because most cellos are handmade, and luthiers will use a template. They'll follow a certain school of instrument making. They're well-practiced. But with anything handmade, there's going to be some sort of slight fractions of a millimeter type of, I don't want to call them imperfection, but it also doesn't have, uh, you know, and machine made cellos don't often have a um, nuanced sound maybe, except for one you guys are going to hear later. Hint, hint, I have a cello that's technically made by a machine and it sounds fabulous. But what I'm saying is there, it's impossible to make carbon copies, right? Um, unless, like I said, it's um, very rare to not have a wolf, but they do exist. It's cool that you got to play one, but I would love to hear that cello when the weather changes. Um, that might be part of it. Um, I also want to address something in the chat. I think we have a misunderstanding. This is cello tips and tricks live stream. Um, this isn't a live stream for piece or song requests. So this is an educational live stream where the point is for me to talk and demonstrate on my cello. So if I do a live stream for song requests in the future, um, that's the right stream for you, but I'm not a show monkey where you can demand pieces and I play them. So this is an educational live stream, not a performance live stream, okay? Thank you. Cool. Um, and yeah, you, uh, you can request a piece and realize it's educational and you, you don't have to be rude about it. Okay, thank you. Whoops, there goes my screen. There we go. Just checking Instagram for the questions. For the questions. All right, how are we doing on YouTube? We doing good? All right, sounds awesome. Good, 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 good. Awesome. Cool, let's see. Yeah, some people are saying their cellos don't have wolf tones. Consider yourself lucky. It, it, a lot of it also depends on the climate your instrument was made in and also um, what materials were used, how that wood fluctuates in your climate. Someone wrote, can you, I'm guessing, can you sing? I'm guessing that's what you meant. Can I sing? I can sing. Um, to be honest, I've always wanted to take voice lessons and get, um, figure out my singing style because I really don't know what my voice is good for. Um, I'm open, but maybe someday. Um, I do sing though. I enjoy singing. Um, oh! <laughs> You were going to type something else and then you got cut off. Never mind. Well, now you guys know a fun fact. Yes, I will get to you in a second. How do you qualify a cello bow to be good for you? Yeah, that's a great one. What makes a good cello bow? What makes a good cello bow? And then I'll get to your question about vibrato. Awesome. So... What makes a good bow? Um, one thing too is the balance of the bow. So some, and a lot of this is preference. So one way to kind of feel the balance of the bow is to take your bow hand shape and then tilt the bow sideways and you can feel, is the frog heavier 
or is the tip of the bow heavier? Are they kind of equal? Things like that. And then when you put it on the string and you draw a note, kind of feeling how the balance and the weight shifts as you travel from frog to tip and then the tip back to the frog. So that is something to do is to play a bunch of long tones, see how the weight fluctuates as you travel. And so that is one way to test out a bow. You also wanna see if you lean into it with a full amount and a healthy amount of bow arm weight. Can it support your weight? Um, right now I'm on my favorite bow, my primary bow. Um, and one thing I like about it, it's a, this is again, a, per, a preference thing. It's a little heavier at the tip, which I really like um, because playing at the tip is challenging and we have to maneuver our bow arm weight to sink into something that is so far away um, from where my bow hand is. That's quite a distance. So having some, I prefer something overall that's kind of heavier because I'm, I like to play with a lot of weight and power. Um, but then again, um, I have another bow that is lighter and I like to use that for um, orchestral pieces in the early classical era like Mozart and Haydn. I like to have kind of a lighter bow that's a little easier to bounce. And that's the other tip I would give you is try different techniques, try bouncing. Um, so kind of like a brushy staccato and then a spiccato. And see how it reacts. Do some some hooked up bows and down bows. Just play around with different techniques. Different techniques to see um, how how the bow reacts and is it easy to do multiple techniques? Is it difficult? So that's what I would recommend is balancing and then response. How does it respond to different types of bow techniques? Great. Um, awesome. So I'm going to do a little bit of a ping pong between YouTube and Instagram. So I just did a YouTube. I'll do an Instagram and then I see you with your, um, Okay, awesome. About um, when do you upgrade a cello? That's a great question. So the, this next one was tips for vibrato. Fun fact, I have a free vibrato boot camp. If you didn't know that, on YouTube. Um, it's four weeks, totally free. And in the YouTube videos in the description, there's a link to my website, which has a calendar where I tell you what video to do, what day, you have some rest days, um, and they're basically multiple videos to help you um, if you're just learning vibrato, if you've never learned vibrato. Um, so for any beginning level of experience with vibrato. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about some of my favorite uh, favorite exercises from that video. So one of them is the sliding sirens so sliding sirens are great because cello vibrato incorporates the arm and the wrist kind of has a chain reaction movement. The wrist is active, but it's not the source of the vibrato. It's definitely in the forearm and then some more of the arm eventually going to the back. So to really get in touch with that, we do vibrato sirens. So I would take any finger you would like. And we're gonna start with slow, long sirens. So you can go up to fourth position or if you wanna put your thumb on top, you could go even more. So if you wanna go higher, put the thumb on top. And you can see I'm opening up in my elbow hinge. Let's try just fourth position for now. And you want to be nice and loose. You
you don't want to be jerky in your motion. It should really flow up and down. And really focus on the slow part. Then you do a medium. And then you, you close in. And the point is, even though you're stationary, you really want to try to keep that same rocking motion as you do and if you land and the notes not perfectly in tune that's okay um, it's just an exercise for now and I don't want you to tense up trying to land exactly on a certain pitch so I would do that and really opening up from the arm is so important a lot of people try to do it from the wrist <laughs> And my, my hand looks like it's really active, but if you really notice, there's not much of a change. There's not a lot of oscillation in the pitch. The minute my arm opens up and becomes active, the sound is much more lush and with more variety. So I would do some sirens. Also, a big tip is making sure your thumb comes along and is able to slide. Um, if you clench with the thumb, it kind of locks up your hand and the other mechanisms and puts a lot of tension on your hand. So avoid a squeezing thumb. And another tip I will give you is when you want to vibrate with the fourth finger, support with the third finger. Because if, if you just vibrate on the pinky alone, it's your smallest finger with the least amount of padding. And so there's not much to rock on. And it, it can cause your pinky to lock up for some people. So whenever you have a fourth finger note, you want to add some vibrato to. Pair it with the third finger, okay? And make sure the other fingers, they can be hovering off, but don't have them up in the sky. Have them close to the neck, because if I have all four fingers down, I don't have much access to my wrist while my arm's going. If I release one and two, vibrate with three and four, then my wrist can react to the motion of my arm. So I hope that helps. All right, on YouTube, I got you. Um, I've been playing for almost 1.5 years. Awesome. Congratulations on one and a half years. Um, you're satisfied with your cello. Um, okay, I understand. So you currently have a cello. You've tried some more expensive ones, but you're still happy with your cello. Um, you're playing some difficult pieces. People are encouraging you. That's awesome. Recommend buying a new cello when I face new hard challenges such as a professional orchestra. Sure. So I had a experience similar to yours. Um, so I imagine if you're interested in a professional orchestra, you have music school in mind for college. Um, you'll have a lot of practice, audition practice, there are some that offer courses and programs specifically for orchestra, orchestra intensives, which would be great for you if your goal is a professional orchestra. And honestly, your teacher in college or as you advance and you start getting more teachers, different teachers, I would really get their opinion. Um, thankfully, Shelly, my teacher in my first college for my undergrad degree really liked Shelly and said, you found a great cello. I don't think it's going to hold you back. I think you should be all set. So I really trust the opinion of your teachers. So it sounds like right now the people you have per played and performed for do like your instrument, which is awesome. And as you start advancing and working with more teachers and also keep in mind, um, as you've been playing for more years, you will learn more techniques and more ways 
your cello will respond to these techniques. So I think with time, you'll just get more opinions, more experiences on this cello. And um, if music school is in your future, sounds like it is a big possibility, then your teacher will definitely give you an opinion. I remember all, uh, all of us freshmen, my first year of music school, we kind of all were like, so are you having to get a new cello? Are you having to get a new cello? Because some people were told um, this cello is going to limit you. And it's not like you have to go out immediately and buy one because that's very hard to do. You really want to find the right fit because it is a big investment. It is a lot of money. Um, but, you know, I did have some colleagues who had to spend a couple years looking. So I think you'll get the more opinions you get, the better. And the, peop um, the more people you play for, the better. So... I would definitely just keep asking teachers and people you perform with what they think. Definitely. Because you also have to realize um, the way you hear the cello, sitting behind a cello might sound different once it projects and reaches to the audience. It's not going to sound drastically different because that's very disorienting. But it is going to be slightly different. How it sounds sitting behind it. I've had um, experience playing cellos where I'm sitting, I try it out, and I don't like how it sounds. And people sitting across the room will say, it sounds so good. And me personally, if I'm going to sit down and practice this instrument for multiple hours upon hours, I need to like what I'm hearing too. Because that's very hard to practice something I don't like the sound of. And I think subconsciously it could discourage some people. I might just be one of those people. Um, so I hope that really helps. Um, if you see a professional orchestra in your future, this is the final tip I will give you. You want to have, if it comes down to you will be upgrading your cello in the future, you want to be playing on that well before orchestra auditions. You want to get used to the subtleties of the instrument. You want to have consistent intonation because yes, intonation can alter slightly between cellos. That is for sure. Um, and make sure you have an instrument and you've been used to it for a while. You don't want to walk into an audition with a brand new instrument. Um, you really want to get used to it. Good luck. Sounds exciting. Um, ooh, combining acting with playing. Oh, that's really cool. That's really cool. And that's going to really help you because honestly, great musicians know how to act. I really think so. To analyze characters and... Um, certain um, atmospheres and pieces, it's really valuable to have an acting background or to have some interest in acting and the theatrical. I love the theater. I love it. I love it so much. Um, and I'm a ham for different characters. If you haven't noticed from my videos, I love playing different characters. And I think it helps me musically. I really do. Awesome. Next question. Any advice for composing a song for string quartet? Sure. Sure. Um, I'm interested. Is there a specific aspect of composing you're interested in, such as voicing or just um, things that will be idiomatic on the instrument? I'd be curious because there's a lot of uh, tips I could give you, but I would like to narrow it down to what you prefer. Um, one big thing that comes to mind is, um, yes, the cello is technically the base of the string quartet, but some of the most famous legendary string quartets don't 
stick the cello in that role and leave it there. I'm not just saying that because I'm a cellist and I love a melody. I know that sounds incredibly biased, but I can say the same thing about the viola. Um, the viola has a very unique, beautiful timbre and you don't get a lot of viola melodies and it's a shame because it's a beautiful instrument. So I would say, you know, think about switching the conventional roles up every once in a while harmonizing range things they can do in double stops okay sure um sure that's good oh double stops are a big one and bless you for wanting to be considerate of our double stops um so in terms of double stops on a string instrument um if you can avoid fifths that would be great the occasional fifth is not that bad. Um, once I'm not saying fifths are evil and you should never use them, but for us, it's not as easy as something like a guitar where we just lay the finger flat and we're gonna get a perfect fifth. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna lay my finger perfectly across and it should be a perfectly in tune C and G, right? the G. My G's a little flat actually. So I have to play my fifths a little bit at an angle. So that is okay, but just know that the intonation is going to be a little harder. Um, again, not a bad thing, just something to think about. And it's very good if we have time to prepare those double stops. Um, intervals that are really great for string instruments. Oh, same thing with fourths. Fourths, the intonation can be difficult too. Um, ones that are, oh, um, somebody wrote, good example of fifths is in the Bach first suite a la monde. Yeah, there are some fifths in there. Um, you can always use open string fifths, of course, um, those are easy. Um, intervals that are excellent for strings are sixths. Sixths are great. Um, they're pretty easy. Um, things like that are very easy for us because, excuse me, from cello point of view, we can use one and two, one and three, um, three and four, things like that. Um, the other thing we can do pretty well are minor sevens. Um, you know, to, to set up a cadence or something like that. Um, minor sevens. Major sevens are kind of a big stretch. Um, again, not impossible, but a little more difficult. Uh, octaves please don't give us octaves again at that point i mean here's the thing i like playing octaves but i love using my thumb and third finger and you're kind of getting into concerto virtuosity there a lot of concertos have double stops that are octaves fifths things like that um so it kind of depends on are you gonna have a group that you can work with for a while or is this something where you get one reading, one chance at a recording? A lot of people don't know this, but composers in music school, they're so excited. It's so fortunate to get a chance to have their pieces sight read and recorded. And if your piece is very hard to play, um, you don't always have a lot of rehearsal time. So that is something, it's gonna be one reading. How did I know? How did I know? Yeah. I wonder if you're in school. I'm wondering. Um, but yeah, that's that's a very typical setup for schools. Um, no rehearsal, sight reading on the spot. Yep. I promise this isn't a friend of mine that I said, can you come on the live stream and make me seem really smart? And wait until I mention readings. <laughs> um, yeah, that's very typical. 
Um, so yeah, I would avoid um, fifths, fourths, and octaves if you want sight reading and ease and you want double stops. Also, ironic, kind of on the flip side, tritones are pretty easy for us. Even though fourths and fifths um, are a little more, again, they're not impossible. They're just a little more challenging to tune, especially amongst four people. So again, um, sixths are great. Tritones are great. Minor sevenths are great. Um, fourths and fifths are fine if they have a couple beats rest to prepare for them. Yeah. And again, um, cello is a very powerful, awesome bass instrument. Viola can be a supporting tenor, alto type voice, and that's all really great, but you can experiment with flipping that around. Um, right now, um, I'm working on a piece by Ravel. Um, oh man, and if you want out of the box, ingenious string writing, study Ravel String Quartet and Debussy String Quartet. It's amazing how they get all these different colors and sounds. Oh yeah, rock song with string quartet. Hell yeah, I love it. Yeah, tritones would be great. You could also do um, sol ponticello in lower strings. Or a... It kind of gives an electric guitar vibe if you have, um, or something like that. So that's a, that is, um, granted, I mean, it doesn't have to be a fifth. Um, I mean, it's a little easier to do slides with a barred finger if you want to. Yeah, so you could do some sol ponticello glissandos or tremolos and it kind of gives the effect of distortion. So that's a fun fact. You do have a gliss, cool. Um, I don't, I shouldn't assume it's alternative rock. It could be classic rock, it might be heavy metal rock, I'm not sure, but sol ponticello is a great way to translate distortion for classical players. Yeah, good luck. Sounds awesome. Sounds really, really fun. Um, oh, and if there's a vocalist involved, um, make sure, well, this is my opinion, okay? So play around with it if you'd like. Um, if the vocalist is singing and the lyrics have a lot of syllables, if the strings are very rhythmic, like a lot of eighth notes or crazy 16th notes, it can kind of muddle up the syllables because there's a lot of rhythms going on. Um, so just something to think about. Um, or you could play around with some of the syllables matching in the strings. Just keep in mind that the more rhythmic energy, cool. Oh, it's star set? No way! I know the cellist of Star Set. I was just, I just saw her yesterday. That's so cool. If you guys don't know Zuzana, um, very fun person, kind person, great cellist. And I think she's, I think that's her band she plays in, Star Set. That's so funny. What a small world. I'll have to tell her, tell her about it. Um, and I really hope, wait. I'm like 99% sure, but I always want to get someone's accolades correct. Star. Yeah, that's her. Yeah, it's star set. Yeah. Zuzana. So fun. All right. Um, do you have a recommendation for a good music theory book? Music theory book. Okay, sure, I will. I'll, I'll definitely pass that along. So cool. Um, a good music theory book. Uh, let me, hold on. There's one I used to use in college that's pretty good.
but I, I just feel bad because it is expensive because it's a textbook. Um, but if you want, um, let me see. Do, do, do. Yeah, it's tricky though, because I don't know how widely available textbooks are outside of college. Um, hmm. You know, I am seeing some interesting things popping up on Amazon that aren't, look like they have some good, ah, uh, oh wait, here's one, this one, this one's pretty good. Where is it? Mm. Oh, okay. Wait, is that really what I, no. Is that what I got myself? Well, this is embarrassing. <laughs> is this really what I got myself? So there's a book, the cover looks familiar. It's, no way. It's called The Complete Idiot's Guide to Music Composition. <laughs> <laughs> is that what I got myself? Well, that's embarrassing. Maybe, I don't know. That looks familiar. The cover looks familiar. Um, it's about writing melodies, but there is, I wouldn't recommend, that's a composition book. It would have some music theory in it. Um, no, what is it? Mm. Hold on. See, my, my textbooks are in the other room. Otherwise, I would show you. I think there's one by Alfred. There's a very, yeah, okay, here it is. Um, no, that's not it either. Damn. You know, I'll have to, I might have to put that in the YouTube comment section because I don't want to take too much time. We have a couple other, um, we have a couple other questions I want to get to, but there is something called Alfred's Essentials of Music Theory. Um, and this one looks promising. I've, I've used Alfred Music books before and they've been great. Alfred's Essentials of Music Theory, The Complete, and it's only $17.99. It's really not that bad in terms of pricing. Um, okay. Cool. So, it says I'm having issues with my stream hmm, on YouTube. Well, we'll see. Let me know on YouTube if there's uh, issues, issues with that. I don't know what's going on. Ha, huh. it says my, hmm. All right, cool. Awesome. So um, I would look into some Alfred music theory books, Alfred music. Um, and what I will say too, if there's a, cause for example, this one says like note values. I mean like quarter note, what a quarter note is, what an eighth note is. You might not need that much. Um, three, four time signature, flats, sharps. Exactly. So these are things that you probably already know if you're already playing Bach. So um, I would say you probably need to start, like this one has lesson 35, perfects and major intervals. What are intervals? So look around, um, shop around, make sure, I mean, you don't want to buy a book and then find out you only need the last chapter. Make sure you look at the table of contents and see what you would recognize. Awesome. 
Um, I got a little problem with fast pizzicato. Um, yeah. Okay. I, I'm not, mm, I don't know if I've played that. Maybe I have. Fast pits on two fingers. So what you can do, um, pizzicato between two or more strings very fast. Um, if you have time, if you have some rests before your pits or after your pits, you can take your bow, put it under your lap, do the pizzicato, and then during the next rest, take it out. It's kind of rare we can do that, but it is possible. I have been able to do it before. You just need some rests before your pizzicato and after your pizzicato. So if you can put your bow on your lap, you have more time. Um, so you're able to do that. If you can't do that, I mean, I'm still, with two fingers. There's no rests. Oh, darn. Uh, tell me who the composer is. I'll, I'll let you know. There's a lot of Sicilians, so who's the composer? So you can kind of do... Aha! Okay. I see. Yes, I have played that piece, but I don't know if my edition had pizzicato in it. Let me look. It might be, yeah, let me take a peek for you. Let me see. Yeah, so it depends on also who the arranger was and all of that. Let me look. Let me go to the IMSLP. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Arrangements for cello and piano. All right. Cool. Let me take a peek at this. But in general, um, okay, so you can't put down your bow. That's okay. Um, if you can't put down your bow, that's okay. We can still... Um, one thing to think about too is where you're hitting the string with your pizzicato finger. Let me take a quick peek. Are, are you talking about just the ending? The, um, that one? Just the ending? That's what I see are some pizzicatos at the end. No. Okay. Well, for some reason, the arrangements that I can find on IMSLP don't have pizzicato in them. I'm sorry, but I can give you some general tips for multiple note pizzicato. Um, um, you can, you can send a link if you'd like. This will have to be the last question. Um, this might have to be the last question for the stream and that's okay, you can send me a link. Um, what I can tell you in the immediate is to try to pluck really far on the left side. If you kind of go on top of each string, it's a little easier. Um, that's okay. Tuning in last minute, that's fine. All streams are available after, after the fact. Um, uh, on the three, four. What is up with me? Am I, am I having just, am I looking I don't know. 
I don't know what's up with me. Sicilian by 4A. I'm looking at a virgin and I don't see pits. What is up with me? You know, it's very possible I'm looking at the wrong Sicilian because I believe he wrote a couple. Um, oh, you had your first viola lesson today. Awesome. You'll get there. You'll be able to. I Hot take. I love the viola. I don't know if that's a controversial take. But I do love the viola. I really like the viola. I love the sound. It's unlike any other string instrument. It's so good. I mean, they all have a unique sound, but I think the viola has some sort of like wisdom in its sound. Um, let me take a peek for a sec. I have an idea. Cello. And if you have that cover, let me know. Otherwise, I'll, I'll tell you what. Um, oh, I think I found it. Yep, yeah, I think I found it. I was looking, okay, I got you. I think I found it. Um, yes, okay. Yep. Let me see. I just have, is there just the cello? Aha! Okay, I got you. I'm telling you, my dolls, I will do everything I can <laughs> to help you. Um, What movement is it in? I'm looking very quickly. See, for some reason, I don't see your link. I'm very sorry. I don't see your link. But I found, I found Cecilia 4A in 3-4. Just looking for the pits. Hmm. I don't see pits in this one. Man, I'm very sorry. Okay, for some reason, I'm not getting your link. I'm very sorry. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. You, if you can send me an, an, an Instagram message, I will send you a personal video helping you out with the pits. I promise. So even if um, I'm not able to help you out in this minute, I really want to help you and I really want to, uh, I, re I really want to help you out with this question. I'm sorry I couldn't quite find the music. Um, so why don't you um, put a link, comment on the YouTube video with the link, and I'll send you a personal video on Instagram with some tips as a big thank you for your patience. All right, my dolls, thanks you so much for a wonderful stream. I always love hearing your questions and what you're interested in. I will see you next month for our next stream. And again, if you have any lingering questions and you couldn't make it to the live stream, please comment on the YouTube video and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. And I know I owe you a personal video, so promise I'll get that to you. Thank you all so much. It's always a pleasure to come hang out with you all once a month. And I will see you in April for our next Cello Tip Thursday Live. Bye, my dolls. Happy practicing.